start with the structure. Chapter 11, the nervous system. This is the major communication organ system of the body. part and uh, the spinal cord. So basically, the cranial part is the brain brain stem. Stem right below, and then spinal cord down to there. So when they say cranium, that's your bony skull cap. It's a word that means helmet. Spinal cord is protected by the vertebral column, although it's not shown here. And the brain and spinal cord um, basically comprise the uh, CNS level. So, brain and spinal cord CNS. And if you were to remove the brain and spinal cord from its protective cases, you would have to cut all these paired nerves that emerge off the brain, brain stem, and off the spinal cord. And so what we're gonna learn later in the course is that um, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that emerge off the brain, brain stem. Shorthand for nerves, plural. And um, 31. Well, think of the, the spinal cord as a cord that is segmented. And at each one of those segments, it issues one pair of um, spinal nerves. So 31 segments or 31 pairs of spinal nerves emerge from a segmented spinal cord. Okay, segmented. And at each point, you issue 31 pairs of <coughs> spinal nerves. So at this level, think of this as, well, it's called the peripheral nervous system. Um, all the nerves, okay? They'll go and innervate all the different body parts, your muscles, your skin, your glands, everything. And so the function of this system, that's the basic, basic anatomy, uh, we, can, we, can, we can start to learn about how this is um, the major communication system. <coughs> I'm using this picture as an example. What you see here, you have different sets of cells that have different functions for this communication. You have sets of cells for one receptors. You know, some something that's 
allowing you to interact with the world you're in, so you're aware of it. In, in the example, I, I guess you're thirsty, so you, so you see a glass of water. So how do you see? You know, there's cells called the photoreceptors in the eye. We'll, we'll learn about those later. It's a little photoreceptor cell. You know, that, in this example, is vision. So you, you see something. And, and then you have sets of cells that, uh, what they call a sensory input on the figure. Another word that's used is um, afferent. It's like when you're affected by something, you receive some news and it affects you emotionally or something. Affect, afferent means, well in this case it means information is going to the CNS. I mean that's really what it means. Information from PNS to CNS in, in that direction. Okay, so this green cell, this cell of integration, we call it the uh, interneuron. It's in between this one and that one. So what you're supposed to get out of that is this cell, all of its parts are completely contained within the central nervous system whether it be brain or spinal cord. <coughs> Cell is entirely within the CNS, your, your, your area of integration. And what, what's the job of, of the CNS to receive the information, interpret the information, and mobilize the correct output? And that's what the interneuron is doing. Receives info. Mobilizes. Correct. Mobilizes. Receives info. Mobilizes. Correct output. And that's basically what's going on there. And it's um, as you can see, the sensory cell the synapse onto it, it stimulates that cell, and then the motor cell correct motor cell is in stimulated. In this case, the correct output would be to um, affect this muscle to flex. So the motor output, you have sets of cells that are designed for motor output. <coughs> so very basically, it's info from CNS to PNS. And so that, it's, a, it's the red cell on the figure, and um, you have sets of cells that are, are being effected, effectors. Well, in this example, it could be a gland, it could be an organ, in this case it's a skeletal muscle. There, there's a nerve that innervates, you know, it could be the musculocutaneous nerve. Anyways, we'll, we'll learn the nerves, okay? Um, so think of um, the sensory input and the motor output. The red and blue, that's usually the color they use for motor and sensory. They're, they're like, um, two and four, they're like telephone cables. They're, they're going in and out and in and out and um, we have to learn the different parts of the cell. The, the telephone cable analogy makes more sense. I mean, here's another analogy with, with the same idea. In this case, 
uh, the receptor, we learned about the different receptors in the skin, right? We learned that you have receptors for pain and temperature, the free nerve endings. We have receptors for fine touch, proprioception, vibration. And when they stimulate the sensory neuron, it integrates, and then you mobilize and do the correct um, flexor muscle to flex away from the painful stimulus. So it's the same idea. And in this example, they also show you one segment of, of a spinal cord. Okay. Each segment of the spinal cord is sending nerves to different patches of skin. That's called a dermatome. I'll remind you of that later. For now, I want you to know the basic um, parts of a neuron. Okay, so this is what I'm starting out with, just before I erase it. This cell is like, boom, this one in my sets of cells for one, two, three, four, five. It happens to be this one I'm using as an example to teach the basic parts of um, these communication cells. So before I start talking about this, um, one, one of the things you're supposed to see when I sh show you these steps is the concept of a nerve pathway. That's the idea that you have a series of cells in a row, right? Like the blue to the green to the red. You're supposed to, you know, I should basically call that a nerve pathway. say a series of cells in series, it's kind of redundant. But, well, the reason I mention that is because when we study this, if you're like in a chain of cells, you're receiving information, you're passing it on, you have to have an area of input and then an area of output. I think I might have mentioned that before. So for um, the neuron, it happens to be a motor neuron. So calling it that, you know the function of it. That word means information from CNS to PNS. Neuron is the cell type. Neuron is the main communication cell of the central nervous system. Motor neuron is an example. Any neuron is the communication cell of the system. They're excitable cells. They have a regular cell body the nucleus. We call the cell body a soma. I believe they uh, illustrate nasal bodies. There, there are dark things you see under the microscope and they're um, filled with neurotransmitters. as vesicles, uh, with neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter 
is the, you know, the communication uh, chemical that we learned about the neuromuscular junction. And what's the one we studied in the neuromuscular junction? It starts with an A. Remember studying ACH? That's a neurotransmitter. Okay, so for this cell to communicate, it has to have an area of input. So there's all these little specialized uh, processes. Dendrites. These specialized processes is where other cells can synapse onto them. So think of them as areas of input. Dendrites. So you can, you know, if you're in a chain of cells, you have to like receive info from the cell before you in the chain, right? So imagine um, another cell with its axon terminal synapsing onto there. And maybe another one, its axon terminal synapses onto there. Uh, the main area of output is the axon. So I'll draw one long extension like they have there. Area of output. You don't synapse onto that extension. You can synapse onto the dendrite. You can synapse onto the cell body, the soma. You can also synapse onto that proximal portion that gives rise to the axon. They call that the axon hillock. You can synapse right onto there. So I've given you three locations that are considered areas of input. Number one, uh, well I guess soma. Number two, dendrites. Number three, axon hillock. Three areas of input. And, and you're using your chemicals to excite or inhibit a cell. Let's say you're trying to excite it. You want to give it enough jolt to like have this wave of depolarization to kind of like you're just zapping it so it's like the wave of depolarization it like, it like moves towards this uh, axon hillock area and if it's, a, it's enough of a jolt you'll fire an action potential from this location okay so you're trying to stimulate the cell by zapping it in different locations we'll talk about the details of that Now, that, that would be, let's say you generate an action potential, what they call that the nerve impulse. Okay, so if you generate a nerve impulse, it, it kind of looks like that in the lab when you kind of measure it anywhere along the axon, and it's able to propagate in one way all the way to the um, axon terminal right there. So the axon terminal is um, where you synapse onto the next cell of the series. So maybe there's a dendrite. of the next cell in the series. And you release your neurotransmitter onto all the little ACH receptors that are there. Um, so the thing is, these um, nasal bodies, there's an axoplasmic flow where these have to also travel down the tube of the axon 
to kind of be stored in the axon terminal. I, I didn't really draw that, but it's understood. They're made here in the cell body. Um, I think the term is axoplasmic. So my spelling may be a little bit off. It's just referring to the cytoplasmic flow of these little vesicles ending up here. So you can like release there. You can read about it in the book. The other thing I wanted to mention is to speed up the, um, the conduction velocity, there are Schwann cells that wrap around the length. So each of these is their own cell. They label it right there, Schwann cells. So let me include that in this picture. cell, they provide myelination, let me write that on the board, we'll look at a better picture of it later, they, the myelination speeds up the impulse, I'll explain exactly why in another lecture, so I'll put the myelination increases conduction velocity of the action potential or nerve impulse. So, this area of output, the axon, When, when we listed those nerves on the board earlier, how many cranial nerves, how many pairs? 12, and how many for the spinal cord? 31. Those nerves actually consist of axons, or fibers. So that's what really nerves are. So whenever you get on someone's nerves, that's a metaphor, but actual nerves and anatomy, um, they're cable-like structures, and they're filled with many, many, many of axon fibers that are either motor or sensory in function. Composed of axons. Motor, sensory, or both. you see these little cable-like structures running throughout the body. They don't have the cell bodies, okay? It, it's the telephone cables, it's the axons, information going one way or the other, right? If there's a nerve running from here going to my central nervous system, it's sensation. If it's gonna innervate a muscle, it's motor. All right. You can see nerves with the naked eye. You, know, you don't need a microscope. You need a microscope to see individual cells, though. So um, another, this is a, a motor neuron. So motor describes its function. Its structure is more described as here multipolar because it has a cell body with many poles coming off of it. One big one, an axon. So that's another way you can describe this cell, aka multipolar structure. Here's one that's bipolar in its structural design because you can see there's two poles coming off of it, one on each side. So,
bipolar. So neurons are Do I have to explain why it's called bipolar? Two. Two. Boom, boom. Unless they tell you, it's hard to tell which is the area of input or output. Unless they tell you, right? How are you going to know? I don't know. Um, difficult to tell input area from output area. The only example of bipolar I usually come across of is, is in the retina, in the eye. Okay. Uh, see bipolar cells. In the, right, that, that's for vision. We'll get to that. They actually communicate with the photoreceptor cells I mentioned earlier. But anyway, so that's a sensory cell. Okay. Because it's retina, vision, sense. Um, we have other cells here. This is a, um, a unipolar design. So this one's sensory in function. So is unipolar. It's also sensory in function. And it's called... Um, Unipolar, sometimes they call it pseudo unipolar. You've you got your one cell body, and you have a single process coming off of it that immediately diverges in two directions. So it's not bipolar. Run that way. Run that way. Draw one long. We have one longer and one shorter. What they call the central process is shorter. It's going to the CNS. The one out in the periphery, which is the receptive ending, maybe it's communicating with the nerve ending or something in the skin. It's longer, peripheral process. signal. So that's a sensory function for that. <clears throat> so um, to kind of like put this in some context, I put a picture of a typical brain brain stem on the left. Uh, ignore the page numbers. This is an atlas I used to require that it's no longer required. But you still get the pictures. Yay. Now look at the blue. Now study that. Which way is the signal going when you're inside the spinal cord if it's sensory? Is it going up or down? It is going up. See the arrows pointing up there. Synapse that. That synapse is that. If anything is going to reach your awareness, you feel it. It's got to get up to the cerebral cortex, your brain, okay, for you to feel it. Um, then for, if you want to react to it, if it's an uncomfortable stimulus, you got your inner neuron there and it communicates with the motor neuron. So now the information is traveling down to the spinal cord and it'll be issued out the correct segment for the correct response. So that, that's the concept there, right? That you have nerve pathways, cells lined up in a series. I said earlier, a series of cells lined up in series. And um, let's count the cells. Okay, how many cells does it take to get to the top for the sensory pathways? So feel something in your skin, like pinch yourself. Grr. I feel that. How many cells? One, two, three. That's it. Then you got your inner neuron. And how many cells to like out, pull away? And then one, two. So two motor neurons, an upper and a lower one, and three to go up, two to come. That's it. Okay? It's not like a, a million cells or something. It's like three or two. All right, so then I have to kind of teach you like 
this vocabulary. You know, and I wish someone spent more time with me when I was a student to walk me through this, because it, it, it's really confusing if you don't spend time with it like now. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through it. The different kinds of sensory, the different kinds of motor. So again, blue, sensory, anything red, motor. make sure I did this with you guys. I can't remember if I did or not. I'm drawing a segment of um, spinal cord here. draw something like this for you before? Yeah. Oh, good. What do we call this little bulbous structure? I don't know if I named that. That's called the posterior or dorsal root ganglia. right here. So you can call it dorsal or posterior. They mean the same things on the back. That's more posterior. Anyways, that whole root from there to there, uh, this whole root is, is the dorsal root, but just that part there is the dorsal root ganglion. I want you to know that because that's where the cell body of the sensory neurons are. Cell bodies of sensory neurons. They're, they're located in that dorsal root ganglion. I drew one cell, but there's many. Okay. Is that inside or outside the CNS? Outside, it's outside the CNS. Okay. Here's the cell body of a motor neuron. Uh, this is the uh, ventral or anterior horn. And there's the axon going with it. So that is the location of the cell body for the motor nerves. Cell bodies of motor neurons. And of course, there's an interneuron somewhere in between. Set that before it, that the whole thing's in the CNS. So, just to um, define the terms on this figure, what, what I did was I just kind of made a list. And whenever you try to decide um, the function of a cell, motor or sensory, and the different kinds of motor or sensory, um, I put that list there to kind of help us navigate. Um, Can I erase this now? Okay, I'll, I'll continue over here. Just a second. Yes, 
Yeah, um, so what I have here are, are a series of examples. And I want you to be able to tell what, which is the, the correct term. But let me define these terms first before we get into it. If something is motor, is that afferent or efferent? It's efferent. So if some, th something is sensory, that's afferent. That's the first thing I got there. Then below that I have, this, if something is um, somatic or um, autonomic. Okay, so before I do that, for sensory afferent, there's two kinds here. There's somatic sensory and visceral sensory, so let me define that. So I'll list it under here. <coughs> A somatic sensory signal comes, it's basically your skin, your dermatome, skin. Your skin is your largest sense organ. The correct term is dermatome. Because remember, the dermis has the nerve fibers, right? Uh, okay, and there's a um, somatic sensor. This rolls out. Uh, anatomy viscera means. Um, Contents, so organs. I'll give you the example of a stomach there. Remember, my anatomy professor gave the example of drink coffee, eat a bran muffin, and you feel like you got to go. Those those feelings, right, that you feel in your guts. That's visceral sensory. Okay, then for motor, motor is somatic or autonomic. So I'll continue motor over here. So again, motor is going from CNS to PNS. So what are we affecting for somatic motor? They it's basically skeletal muscle, okay? So this or motor is basically uh, motor commands to glands. Like for example, if you get hungry, you see food, you start salivating. The gland secreting something because of a, a stimulus from a nerve is a motor function, visceral motor. Or sweating, or tear production. Okay, I'll give you a few examples. Glands, okay. Um, could be smooth muscle. Di the digestive tract, the smooth muscle there, you're contracting to, to push food forward. That We call that peristalsis. Or your blood vessels constricting to increase blood pressure. We call that vasoconstriction. Could be cardiac muscle. They usually list that as example. Um, an example of. I'm just trying to give you different examples of visceral um, motor function. We usually call that autonomic. So associate visceral motor things with the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic function.
the last thing I want to define here is that autonomic can either be sympathetic or parasympathetic. Call that the, the fight or flight response. Um, let me give you just one example. I have a whole we have a whole chapter on autonomic just to introduce the idea of what sympathetic fibers do for an emergency type of response. Um, you increase your strength, increase metabolic strength. There's only two ways you can increase strength lifting heavy weights and hypertrophy in your muscles or uh, uh, an emergency response, uh, very, very stressful. They call it metabolic strength. Um, and they use fight or flight because that's usually how people react. Like I remember watching one TV show and they had this setup of this hidden camera where this guy will pop out of a box and scare people passing by in a hallway. And most people react like flight, they cower away. Every once in a while you get a guy who reacts by punching him in the face. So it literally is you react one way or the other. Okay. Uh, well anyways, a parasympathetic, that's kind of like the default. It's always on. You're relaxed. There's no, there's no quiz today. If I said there's a quiz right now, you'd get nervous. I mean, this will kick in. But there isn't, so you can relax. And it's parasympathetic. They call that the rest and digest. Uh, let me give one more example. In terms of heart rate, if it's a fight or flight response, you think that's elevated or decreased? Elevated. elevated. So then what would the counteractive response be for parasympathetic decrease? So they kind of counteract each other sometimes. So in this example here, a neuron carrying signals away from the CNS to biceps brachii, which is muscle, causing it to contract. Okay, I mean, how would you categorize a cell with that function? First of all, is it motor or sensory, based on how I phrase it here? Carrying signals away from CNS to biceps. That's a motor function. Okay. And biceps brachii is what again? A muscle. So it's motor efferent. Is it somatic or autonomic? <coughs> If it's a muscle, it's somatic. So that nerve has a uh, somatic motor function. I have other examples here. But I'm looking at the clock, and we'll, we'll go through these later. So what you should do uh, when you study this weekend, go through the rest of the examples. And just go through our list of terms that I've defined and see if you could call it the right thing. And when we start again on Monday, we'll, I'll check to see if we got it right, basically. All right, so what I want to do is I want to demo the, uh, the lab. I want to turn on my bio pack here. So if you see if we got our setup over there, I have your little goodie bag. Uh, I just put everything you're going to need, hopefully I didn't forget anything, in here. And see those big black cases? They have the bio pack in them. And so we can expect to find, um, you can look at your lab procedure on page one. And uh, do you guys see the blue box on my desk here? Let me move this. Yeah, well, that's, that's the bio pack. You guys are going to have a, a, a slim laptop in your box, and all the cables are there too. Um, I'm going to introduce the lab, I'm going to demo it, then we'll take a break. And when we come back, hopefully around 8.45-ish, um, I want you to complete this lab by 10.30. I know class ends at 10.50, but I need to like put all the stuff away before the next instructor comes. So I need about, I need that time to uh, break the lab down after you guys are done. Put things back the way you got it.
So what you got to do is, when you set your thing up, it's a laptop connected to the blue box, and it's just a USB cable. So, okay, let me go to, um, so look at my desktop here, which is a mess, by the way. But what you got to look for after you power everything up, do you see this icon I'm clicking here? Okay, you see it, we'll describe it, what color is it? If you're sitting in the front, it, it's hard to see in the back. It's a little green man. It's a little green icon. It's, it's the, that's the BioPack icon you double click. That's our software there. And if everything was set up correctly, um, we're doing LO2 EMG2. So you see this menu here? If you see this menu, you're gold. You set it up right. If you don't see it, you need to troubleshoot. Oh, what, what do we do wrong? Maybe I can help you. Uh, that's LO2 EMG2. And if you're following your procedures, it says on page 2, step 5, select lesson LO2 EMG2. Okay. You can like name a folder. So you can name your folder and save it. But what I would do is, as you move along, I would record all the data as you go along. So if you, if you have to go back and you can't find it, you're kind of screwed, right? you got to do it over again. So I would just write as you go, so you don't have to worry about that. But go ahead and save a folder anyways. Let me get to this screen. Okay. So uh, the EMG lab... Let's chip over my bag here. It's electromyography. EMG stands for electromyography. I never write it out, but basically we are detecting the electrical muscular activity with skin electrodes. Detect electrical muscle activity using skin electrodes. And if you look at your procedures, I'll show a picture of a guy's forearm. I'm going to pull my sleeves up. And so there's a lot of muscles here we haven't learned. This is the anterior compartment of the forearm. This is a flexor compartment. Okay. So if I squeeze, we call that clench or grip, these muscles are active. And the electrodes, you put um, negative positive negative to positive across there, you're, you're detecting all the um, electricity there. It'll register on the screen. Okay, so let me uh, show you how to do that. So I'm empty out my uh, goodie bag. Oh, we got tape. Uh, so I my electrodes. So that's a guy here. Oh, I got, this is a hand gripper so I can detect force. Um, I think I gave everyone six. Because you got to do three for your dominant arm. I'm left-handed. And then you'll, you'll do the non-dominant arm. For me, that would be my right hand. So I, I give you three of those. Now, these sit in, on the shelf for a long time. So uh, I also give you al alcohol swaps. Tape measure. Because um, at one point, you're going to measure the girth um, at the thickest part of your forearm. I got dinky forearms, but um, me measured on your subject. Here, here is the electro gel. This is very important because these dry out over time. The electrode, do you see how like there's like a metal thing? That's important, the metal's important. That's how you conduct the signal. Because, um, yeah, the electrodes, they have a lead and they're colored. Uh, black is ground and white's negative and red's positive, okay? So these are the leads and they clip on to the metal part of your skin surface electrode. Now to get a clear signal, uh, well, if you really want to go seriously, I mean, what they do is they take a razor and then like, they shave away all the hair and dead skin. We don't have to do that. We use an alcohol well, I bet. Yeah. Uh, get away the basic grime. And so I'm looking at where I'm going to place the electrodes. Just proximal, boom, and then distal, 
inside and outside there. I just give you a nice little rub there. Okay. And then you have to take a little dab of electro gel and you have to like. Uh, so the, the metal part is the front, but on the back, all the gel has dried out over time. So I gotta like rehydrate that thing. A little dab. 